was talking with someone recently, someone who is curious about Zen and Buddhism, but is really still trying to get a grasp on what it is. And we were talking about Seshin, this kind of intensive, dedicated practice. And uh, they just said with like such earnestness, like, why do you do this? And we all ask that. That's, you know, every every time we have counsel or talk about our retreat together, everyone's like, why am I doing this? Um, so it's a question that comes up a lot. Um, but there was so much, like, sincerity in, like, the pain and the confusion of this question of, like, I don't get it. Why are you doing this? And so I've just been really thinking about that a lot. And... Uh, here at Sweetwater, you know, our session participation, like we usually have, you know, 15, 20 people sign up and about 17 of those 20 come like for an hour here or there. Or maybe they do one day or a little bit. And so I just kind of wanted to highlight the power and uh, and just my experience with this real dedicated practice and what it's really like. Um, so really dive in and do a full session and take the time and make the commitment to do something like this. Um, and so the best way that I've been able to think about it is by, I'm also going to introduce a little bit of kind of basic Buddhist philosophy kind of stuff, which is not something that I like to talk about very often. We don't talk about it much here. I'm not a scholar or an, an expert on like Buddhist stuff necessarily. Um, our way is more about this kind of direct experience um, through Zazen, through Seshin. I mean, that's the thing. The Seshin practice, if you really want to see what the Buddha was teaching and what Buddhism really gets to the heart of, for me, for our lineage, for this particular practice, session and intensive practice is kind of the only way to do it. If you just come to Dharma talks, if you come and sit for 30 minutes, an hour here or there, that's great. And you will see the benefits and you will get closer to your community and, and it's wonderful. But if you really want to penetrate what the Buddha did, what the Buddha saw and taught, and what has been passed down, um, these, this kind of intensive practice is, is where it's at. Um, so, why do we do it? Why do we do it? Um, so, okay, sorry. I wanted to talk about it in terms of a Buddhist concept called the skandhas. Skandhas, or also known as the aggregates. So this is, again, something if you like look up Buddhism on Wikipedia, you'll see something about the skandhas. Um, and the, the skandhas or the aggregates, they're usually talked about in five. There's five skandhas, five aggregates. But if you look around and go to different lineages and read different pages and stuff, there's actually kind of six that are used kind of interchangeably. So we'll just talk about all those. Um, but broadly, the skandhas are Buddhism's attempt at trying to categorize everything that it is to be alive. These five or six phenomena make up everything that is our human experience. So what are those aggregates or skandhas? Consciousness, form, sensation, perception, volitional energies, and the other one that's used is mental formations. And they kind of swap those out depending on which teacher or lineage or whatever scholar that you uh, look towards. Um, so think about that. It's, you know, it's always such a weird thing to say, 
these five things make up the entirety of your life, or these six things describe everything that you've ever known. But, you know, we do what we can. We do our best. So this is Buddhism's attempt at um, trying to encapsulate every aspect of being a sentient being. So consciousness, the very awareness that we are a thing in the world, or some people say that consciousness is the one supervising skanda that is aware of the other four or five. Um, form, body, buildings, bank accounts, presidential elections, clouds, air conditioning, form, uh, sensation, feelings, reactions, emotions, uh, then perception, the ability to perceive things, sound waves, light particles entering in and out, tactile, being able to perceive, sense things. Uh, volitional energies is kind of like our will to act, uh, our ability to manufacture and cause things and, uh, yeah, take action, the volitional energies. And uh, the last one, mental formations, so being able to conceive of things. Uh, a lot of the ones that you'll see, they kind of leave out. They kind of, inter mostly they interchange mental formations and volitional energies. I've seen those kind of swapped out. So anyway, uh, it doesn't really matter uh, which is right or how comprehensive it is. But let's just kind of accept the idea that these skandhas make up everything that it is to be a human, right? In our relative reality, waking up as Bobby, getting up and brushing my teeth and doing my life, as a thing in the world, the skandhas kind of uh, make that up. And in a way, and this is tricky, so don't hold me to it, but in a way, what the Buddha taught and what the Buddha woke up to was that the skandhas are the reason, let me rephrase, attaching to the skandhas Believing wholeheartedly in the skandhas is the reason that we suffer. Thinking that that's all we are. My awareness, my body, my family, my feelings, my perceiving, my actions, my concepts, my understanding. That's kind of our default. We think that that's all it is. That's our life. And that's who I am, and that's what I have. And it starts at birth and it ends at death. And what the Buddha teaches, and you know, forget the Buddha, what we can all see through meditation or whatever our practice is, is that in fact, um, we are bigger than that. We are independent of these skandhas. These skandhas are impermanent. Trying to get a hold of any of them is like trying to grab a fistful of water. And yet, we believe so firmly that these skandhas, these aggregates, these aspects of our kind of relative small self is all we have. And so the reason I bring this up is because one of the ways I've been thinking about doing session practice is that if you come to session, if you really want to penetrate what it is to, to practice the Buddha way with the intention of fixing or enhancing or even healing any of these skandhas, I don't know that you will be thoroughly satisfied. Um, and that's what the Buddha was after. The Buddha was not after fixing his form or his relationships. 
he wasn't after feeling better. He wasn't trying to be smarter or get anything. He said, all this stuff that makes up my little life is not satisfying. There's a bigger question. What is there outside of these impermanent, always changing things? What else is there? Is that all I am? And he just wasn't satisfied. Right? He had access to Hinduism and yoga practices and all these kinds of things, and he just wasn't satisfied. What else is there? I'm so confused. How does this make sense? We put all this import into all these things in my life, and then I just go into the ground. How does that make any sense? And so I think that Coming to Sashin or coming to Zazen with the intention of addressing any of these skandhas, you know, I think it works a little bit. I think if you do Zazen, you'll notice that uh, you feel healthier. You may notice that you're more easily able to not eat sugar. Uh, you might uh, get a little more patient. Maybe you experience a little like ease in your stress temporarily. But to be honest, I think for all those things, there are better tools out there. If you're trying to heal an old wound, if you're trying to understand the teaching conceptually, if you're trying to feel better in your day-to-day -day life, if you're trying to have better relationships, I think there are better tools out there. I'd send you to a therapist. I'd send you to a you know, personal trainer. I'd send you to a class on Buddhism or philosophy or something. So the reason I do Seshin and Ango too, there's this thing called Ango where for three months, 90 days, we meditate for five, six hours a day, every single day. It's a very intensive, dedicated practice. And in my experience, that kind of practice has done very little to make my skandhas better. I can't lie to you. I'm being a terrible salesman here, I know, but kind of on purpose. But what it does do, unlike anything else that I've ever tried, which isn't a lot, I have to admit, but for me it just really works, to get in touch with this bigger, independent, liberated self, what we call true self, our Buddha nature, this self that exists. It's so hard to find the right preposition or adjective. Um, this self that exists bigger than, outside of, and within. Um, independent of these skandhas. And the more I get in touch and the more intimate I get with that self, the more these skandhas become way more manageable. I can see them more clearly. I stop being simply my body, my thoughts, my understanding, and my feelings. And all of a sudden, I become this huge, all-encompassing, universal one. And all these little skandhas I experience on a day-to-day -day basis, they're just dust I get to play with. And they stop controlling my life. And so when I feel bad, I can just see, little Bobby's feeling bad now. When I feel good, I can just see little Bobby's feeling good now without getting so wrapped up in that's all I have. Um, it reminds me of uh, if you go through the koan curriculum that we do here, uh, the very last koans you do are uh, koans on the five ranks, Tozan's five ranks. Doesn't matter. But one of the poems or koans that we study starts by saying, a sleepy-eyed grandma 
recognizes herself in an ancient mirror. So just in that one line, there's so much to look at and say, but think about this ancient mirror, this beginningless and endless universe that we find ourselves in right now. To be able to see ourselves reflected in everything, in our skandhas, in your skandhas, in everyone's experience, to really see that we are one with everything and that my true self is not held down by my skandhas. Um, it's a really beautiful thing. It's a very special and unique opportunity we have to see that. And uh, that's what Seshin does for me. And that's why we push through a really difficult schedule and a really hard commitment to make because we get to come face to face with this true Buddha nature, that which exists independent of the skandhas. Uh, I'll just end with another koan that really kind of points to this, I think. Uh, it's case, I want to say 10. Don't quote me on that, but it's a case in the Mumon Khan or the Gateless Gate. And it goes, uh, Seize, who's a traveling monk, he goes and sees Sozan, who's a big Zen master. So Seize comes to Sozan and he says, Master, I am poor, alone, and destitute. Please give me alms. And Sozan says, Venerable Say. And Seize says, Yes. And Sozan says, you have already drunk three cups of the finest wine in all of China, but you still say you haven't moistened your lips. So here comes Sei, that's, that's the whole koan. So here comes Sei Zay, and he's where a lot of us are. I'm poor. I don't have enough. I'm alone. I'm destitute. Desperate, I'm suicidal, I am so confused, I'm not satisfied, I, 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 I'm yearning, this is, you know, we call this the dark night of the soul, I think we've all been there. What is this all about? I've lost, I grieve, I'm aging, I'm not where I thought I should be, uh, I'm an imposter. I'm a failure, and it just feels so bleak, so hopeless. And, and this is just one way to see this koan. I, I should qualify. There's lots of different aspects and ways that we can see this aloneness and destitution. But for now, let's stay with this. My skandhas are broken. The form of my life is fucked up. My sensation is dark. I can't perceive things well. I'm cloudy. I can't even take action because I'm just so, ugh. Please help me. Give me alms. And the Zen master says, Yo, say Zen. It's like, yes. And just that, just that ability to engage in these skandhas that we have. To say hello, yes. What's up, how are you? Just the ability to do that. Just to bear witness to our lives is so magical in a way. And so Sozan says, see? All I did was say, yo, what's up? And you said, yo, what's up? And that right there is the finest wine of all of China. That's as good as it gets. Just this moment. 
but you say that you haven't even moistened your lips because you're looking for something more. Something in particular has to happen in your skanda life in order for you to think that you're okay. And uh, to really see that, to really see that in every single moment when we lose a loved one, when we get the promotion, when we stub our toe, when we lose a relationship, when we win the game, all of it is the finest wine of rare, strange, karmic wine that we get to drink every moment. And it's so hard to see that because when I stub my toe, I just want to punch the wall. <laughs> um, so how do I see that? How do I get in touch with every moment, even the darkest ones, the finest wine? Sashin, it works. It works. It may not make your relative skanda life better. It may not make you smarter. It may not make you, you know, happier. But it can allow you to detach from these skandhas and to see them for what they are, which is this ancient mirror that you get to see your big self reflected in moment after moment. So I hope you'll join us, maybe not this week, but at some point. Try it out. You know, I mean, we spend our whole lives, especially us here in this modern urban life that we have. <clears throat> we do our jobs, we hang out with friends, we have families, we go to therapy, we play beach volleyball, we go to the gym, we do all these things all the time to try to better our scondic situations. I don't think that's a word, <laughs> but it is now. So just see what it's like to take some time, some real dedicated time, to explore what else there might be. You don't have to give it up. You don't have to run away to the monastery and say, I'm going to be free from skandhas forever. But we do that all the time. We try to make our skandhas better. So just see what happens if you take a day or a week or three months to really penetrate this question, what else is this if not the skandhas? I really hope that question lives in your heart. And uh, thank you for listening.